In a recent video on the apparent recruitment problems faced by the late Roman army, I briefly mentioned an idea that historians of late antiquity know as the barbarization thesis. In short, the idea is that the late Roman army, between about 350 and about 460, became dominated by non-Romans, the quintessential barbarians, as evidenced by dress, titles, troops, and fighting techniques, and as a result, possibly became less effective. What I want to do here in this video is a more in-depth examination of the topic, and in doing so, I am closely following the work of Guy Housel and Patricia Southern, two of the foremost authorities on the army in this era and on late Roman history more generally. In late antiquity, broadly defined as spanning about 250 to about 650, maybe 700 if you want to push the dates back a bit more, the army was no longer divided into the legions and the auxilia, comprised of Roman citizens and non-Romans on the path to citizenship, as the army had been for about 300 years. Instead, due to the military reforms of emperors such as Gallienus, Aurelian, and Diocletian, all attempting to respond to the chaos of the 3rd century, the army was broken up into large field armies under the command of emperors, known as comitatenses. During the 4th century, more divisions were created. There were the Limitanei, stationed on the frontiers, the Repenses, stationed on rivers, and a number of differing grades of soldier ranging from the Scolae and the Domestici to the Presental, meaning armies in the presence of the emperor, to more general field armies. At one time, it was believed that the Limitanei and the Repenses troops were inferior to the Comitatenses, but while the Comitatenses appear to have been better paid, we know that this difference in fighting quality was not actually the case, and Limitanei often had portions broken off and incorporated into the field armies, where they became known as pseudo-Comitatenses. So, this was the general structure of the army of the late Roman Empire. To understand this army and its relationship to the barbarians across the frontier, we actually have to contextualize it through Roman notions of performative ethnicity and gender. Diocletian's reform separated the civilian and military branches of government. While some commanders were still granted the rank of senator, in general the civilian and military commands were now distinct. One could not be a governor of a province and a general. In this world, what it meant to be a Roman man, or to be seen as manly, was tied up closely with service in the bureaucracy, mastery of one's emotions, and the pursuit of an education with plenty of time for leisure and the application of that education to scholarship. If you acted in this manner, you were seen as manly. In other words, notions of masculinity for the Roman elite were not necessarily attached to the military, although we should note that the bureaucracy had a somewhat militarized dress. The belt, for example, which was a soldier's item, was a symbol of status in the government. What this did was establish the army as a world unto its own, and it's argued strongly by historians like Patrick Amory and Hugh Elton that the army consciously played up this distinction. Ammianus Marcellinus, one of our principal sources for the late Roman Empire, tells us that the army adopted a Germanic war cry called the Baritus. This was supposed to be a sound which, when uttered, started out extremely low, and then rose to a crescendo as the soldiers charged, and it has often been seen as a key piece of evidence for the barbarization of the Roman military. But, this has, since the 1990s, been called into question. Ammianus wrote in the style of Tacitus, a Roman historian active in the first century, and he tells of a similar war cry called the Barditus, so it's entirely possible that this war cry was indeed taken from the barbarians, but it is also possible that Ammianus was deliberately copying Tacitus. It's also been pointed out that a baritus was the sound made by an elephant, in which case, Ammianus' description has nothing at all to do with any sort of ethnic connotation, but instead is a descriptor of a particular kind of sound. Ammianus, as a man of middling to high birth, steeped in the classics, may also have seen the bar root of the term and connected this to the term barbarian itself. In short, this was just how barbarian sounded. The point raised by this is actually a crucial one for investigating barbarian influence in the late Roman army. The center of the Roman world was the Mediterranean Sea, and in the Roman conception of the world, the farther you went from the sea, the less and less human you became, to the point that those living at the edges of the world were given terms by Roman writers like man-eater. All of this was filtered through a lens called the Interpretatio Romana, 
the Roman distortion, and that lens, combined with the impact of classical ethnography, meant that to the Romans, barbarians might have different names, but they never really stopped being the same barbarians, and they never really changed in terms of ethnicity. Hence, the Romans often referred to the Goths as Scythians, or if they wanted a more classical-sounding name, the Gidi. The great other to Roman civilization, the mirror of it, was barbarian society, specifically the Germani living across the frontier in Central Europe. These people were frightening to the Romans, in part because, unlike the Romans, they were believed to not control their emotions, and thus in Roman eyes they were not manly, they were wild. And it is due to that fear that the military began to consciously adopt aspects of what they thought barbarians did, regardless of whether or not barbarians actually behaved that way. Sort of like how American Westerns have stereotypes of Native Americans in them, along with other stock characters. The raising of leaders on shields is another example of a supposedly barbarian custom, which thus reflects the supposed barbarization of the military. In the post-Roman West, Germanic kings were raised on shields to demonstrate legitimacy and to demonstrate the support of their militaries, and they apparently believed that this was an ancient custom. However, outside of one reference by one Roman historian in the first century, we have absolutely zero evidence for this. But early medieval kings did do this, and we know that the late Roman army did this, probably most famously with the Emperor Julian in 360 in Gaul. So where did this come from? Was it really a barbarian custom? Well, this is where we get into the question of barbarian recruitment. Thanks to a source called the Notitia Dignitatum, we have a fairly extensive record of the army of the Western Empire around the early 400s and probably the very late 300s for the Eastern Empire. It lists units with barbarian names such as Franci, Salii, Sormati, and Vesi, or Franks, Salians, Sormatians, and Goths, respectively. It's entirely possible that these reflect ethnic units of the military which were recruited from barbarian peoples. However, even if that did happen occasionally, and we don't have much evidence that the Romans actually did do this, it probably is not the case across the board. That same source records units with ethnic names such as Cimbri and Sabini as just two examples. The first refers to a Germanic group which the Romans fought in the last century BC and the second refers to an ancient Italian people which the Romans intermarried with and also fought. Nobody, either in the period under discussion or in the modern day, has seriously suggested that units like this recruited the Cimbri or the Sabines because those ethnic groups have been gone for centuries by late antiquity. So what this probably represents is the adoption and retention of ethnic names of Rome's enemies because they were Rome's enemies. In other words, because they were frightening. A not totally incorrect analogy would be the 10th Cavalry of the U.S. Army, known as the Buffalo Soldiers, which takes its name from what Native Americans called African American soldiers. They had dark skin, like buffalo, hence the moniker. That unit is still around, and it is not a segregated African American unit anymore. But the name Buffalo Soldier has been retained because it is now part of the 10th Cavalry's identity. My overall point is that these Roman names could have originally referred to ethnic units, but the traditions were very likely constructed. So what this suggests, in the words of Guy Housel, is that the army had created for itself a particularly barbarian identity, but one which was a construct, owing much to classical ethnographic traditions. A parallel might be drawn from the types of gladiators used in classical circus games, which included the ethnic stereotypes of Gauls, Thracians, and Samnites. The Romans also named units after wild animals, and some have the title of the Ferus, all of which was meant to conjure up images of bloodthirsty savages and wild beasts. Employing non-Roman peoples in the military had been done for centuries, and it's impossible to really quantify the scale to which this has increased or decreased in late antiquity, although there has been one attempt to do so by Hugh Elton in 1996, and although there are problems related to the paucity of sources between 350 and 425, his conclusion that approximately 75% of all named officers and troops that we know of were drawn from native Romans has been accepted by military historians of the period. This brings us back to the supposed barbarian custom of raising leaders on shields. Between 410 and 440, the Western Empire lost some provinces completely and suffered a series of defeats from which it could not necessarily bounce back. 
not because the Romans were unwilling to serve, but because the defeats drained experienced troops from the military. They also had to reduce the tax burden of some remaining provinces due to devastation. In order to rebuild itself, the army was going to need time. But in the immediate period after these defeats, soldiers were needed. Because the Roman state paid the military through taxes, the solution reached, especially with the Visigoths, but with others as well, such as some Frankish groups, was, because these people were already serving in the military, to settle them and grant them not land, but tax revenue, the famous thirds referenced in the documents from the period. Because these barbarian peoples had existed for decades in a context dominated by the Roman military, and because they now officially existed as Roman armies, what appears to have happened is that these groups adopted aspects of the constructed barbarization of the Roman army. Because the kingdoms of early medieval Europe emerged from these militarized cores, it makes sense to see the tradition of raising barbarian kings on shields, not as some ancestral barbarian custom, but as a legacy of the constructed barbarization of the late Roman army, and the militarization of the population of some northern provinces. With this in mind, the archaeology of northern Gaul suddenly makes a great deal more sense. In what is today northern France, Belgium, and the Rhineland of Germany, there are many graves which contain weapons and other artifacts of military origin, as well as jewelry of Roman and German make. In the late 19th century and the early 20th century, these were interpreted as signifying the spreading of Frankish people into Gaul as they conquered the region and transformed it into Francia, one of the kingdoms of early medieval Europe. Since the late 1980s, though, this view has changed. In light of more excavation and more work being done in the Roman military, along with the realization that the chronology for the spread of the Franks, as demonstrated by this archaeology, is actually wrong. What the sites actually represent is the militarization of Romano-German frontier culture in the context of the late Roman army. Because the Romans often had to choose between the imperial bureaucracy, the church, or the military, and because the army existed in a separate, deliberately constructed social sphere, within the army, notions of Roman masculinity began to change. The soldiers of the 4th and 5th century Roman army looked extremely different from the soldiers of the 1st and 2nd centuries. There was no more Lorica Segmentata, for example, now the dominant armor was male, and pants were worn, in addition to torques and brooches, and the weapons now were not the famous Gladius and the Pilum, but the Spatha and the Francisca. In short, the uniform and equipment of the soldier became barbarian, but even here, it was a barbarization which was deliberately chosen. Torques were said by the Romans to have been a barbarian item, but they don't usually appear in the archaeology of Central Europe in this period. Instead, this item, used by soldiers, appears to have been adopted by the Roman army and made a part of barbarian culture by way of the military. As the Roman Empire lost control of the north, these weapons and armor began to be buried with people. Rather than being evidence of a barbarian takeover, Notions of masculinity and power took on a militarized and barbarized form. So in the context of the Roman army, the warrior kings of the early Middle Ages would emerge. So, to conclude, the barbarization of the army appears to have been largely, although not entirely, a Roman artifact. The Western Roman provincial aristocracy continued to view service in the army as a career choice, which meant participation in this barbarized culture. More importantly, perhaps, the army, like the church, presented an alternative to the traditional civic model of masculinity. The field army units discussed above claimed, through their titles, the whole spectrum of features antithetical to civic masculinity. They are barbarian, fierce, animal, even. There is no room for moderation and control of passions in this competitive discourse of ferocity, nevertheless. While the new identities might have been adopted in rivalry with the civil service and its traditional ideas of Roman comportment, the army personnel did not see themselves as any less Roman. This martial model of late Roman masculinity provided an important resource for the provincial society in navigating the dramas of the 5th century.